Hello and welcome to New Mexico Rising. My name is Dan. You know, each and every week I try to bring people from across the country to talk to me about things we could do in your neighborhood. If you want to be on the show, just email me. That's NewMexicoRising at gmail.com. Coming up on this show, we have this. Pet ownership is at an all-time high with 66% of U.S. households owning at least one pet. Most borrowers have been able to keep up with the payments since the end of the pause. All of that and more right here on New Mexico Rising. With the affordable housing crisis growing in the United States, Habitat for Humanity continues to step in and make a difference. As President Jimmy Carter turns 100, his legacy lives on through the Jimmy and Rosalind Carter Work Project happening now in St. Paul, Minnesota. So joining us this morning are Habitat CEO Jonathan Reckford and Bill Carson from U.S. Banacorp to help talk about the impact of this project and the power of partnerships. Good morning, you two. How are you? Good morning. All right, Jonathan, what's the Carter Work Project all about and how does it stand out from other builds? Well, it is a joyful day here in St. Paul, Minnesota. You hear behind us are the music of a thousand hammers where this week we'll have over 4,000 volunteers building 30 new homes alongside the families that will purchase those homes. The Carter build is like every other Habitat build, just way bigger. It's really our signature event. And this year, it's special in a couple of ways. We are celebrating today President Carter's 100th birthday. And he was very clear that the best birthday present he wanted was us to continue the work he started with Mrs. Carter over 40 years ago, uh, when in 1984, they got on a bus from South Georgia, went up to New York City and rehabbed the tenement building on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And that started that annual pattern of building somewhere in the world for a week. And their direct impact has helped over 4,400 families have newer improved homes but the ripple impact of that has inspired millions to get involved in our mission. And we've helped over 59 million families have newer improved housing uh, since the Carters got involved. So why is it key for Habitat to bring on corporate partners for projects such as this? You know, we couldn't do our work without our partners. It really takes to deal with something as complex as housing. You need the public sector, private sector and civil society organizations working together. And for us, our corporate partners like U.S. Bank, bring financing, they bring philanthropy, they bring both skilled uh, uh, volunteers and construction workers as well. And they, uh, we really couldn't do the work without them. And Bill, U.S. Bancorp has been a longtime supporter of Habitat. Uh, what, what drives your commitment? Well, we're really so thrilled to be here in St. Paul, uh, here in the home cities, uh, the twin cities of Minnesota, U.S. Bank's home city. Uh, with 150 of my colleagues this year, uh, we made uh, philanthropic contributions, uh, volunteer hours, thousands of volunteer hours from our 150 colleagues, um, as well as investments um, in Habitat International and the Carter Work Project this year. This is so meaningful to us in so many ways. Um, a number of my colleagues live here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul community, and so they're helping to build homes for families that live here and are, will be getting a great start with their families in affordable new homes in this uh, brand new large-scale community. We, we also uh, usually are sitting behind the desk and on the phone, and this is a great way of getting out, literally getting your hands dirty uh, to do something that's meaningful for our community. Um, and having the opportunity to work side by side to um, build build something that really is going to mean something for a family, uh, not only today, but for future generations to come. So you've got volunteers from your company on site. What does it mean for them and for others to see these homes uh, coming to life? Yeah, we know that it's more than just about the money. Um, we make a really big commitment and we know it's a really important part for our own employees to give back. They love it. We love being with each other and it really means a lot to be able to be the, to do this type of work in our own home city here in Minneapolis, St. Paul. Jonathan, where can we go for more information and or how could they get involved? Well, if you go to habitat.org, we would love to have you learn how you can be part of helping solve the housing crisis in your local community and around the country and around the world. Uh, we have a huge housing crisis, as you said at the beginning. And sadly, this is a bittersweet week as we celebrate President Carter uh, over 100 of our affiliates across the southeast are struggling with the flooding after Hurricane Helene and beginning the long process of recovery. So we'd love you uh, to go to Habitat.org. We'd love your muscles. We'd love your voices. We'd love your support as we try to build a world where everyone has a decent place to live. Thank you too for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for Great having me. to be with you.
Many Americans with student loans are feeling the pressure now that payments have started again. A new survey shows that borrowers had to adjust their budget, some cutting back even hundreds of dollars each month. And for many, this is making it a harder to consider going back to school. Today, we have Dr. Bill Hensley, president of the National Endowment of Financial Education, joining us to talk about how these changes are affecting people's financial well-being and what can be done to help. Welcome, Dr. Hensley. Thank you. Last October, student loan payments resumed for many borrowers. What does this new survey tell us about how that's affected their financial lives? Yes, yeah, so last October, when the repayment pause ended, we explored what borrowers believed or expected would be the impact on their finances. So here we are a year later. Uh, we know more about the reality of how borrowers are managing those loan payments. Uh, and this is no small number. It's over a quarter of the population currently have an outstanding student loan or someone close to them, such as a child or grandchild. And the news is positive and concerning. Uh, the positive being the majority say they are doing okay, at least for right now. Uh, but keep in mind that nearly one in five may not have had to make payments yet. 27% uh, say the end of the pause has negatively impacted their financial lives, which is lower than the 49% who were anticipating this last fall. So that is a bit of encouraging news. The more concerning news, however, is that mon monthly budgets have been strained with 74% of people having to make cuts, 28% cutting up to $500 a month, 21% between $500 and $1,000 a month. And these are large numbers, especially if you're early in your career and you're trying to make ends meet. Uh, but these polls, you know, they're snapshots of different times uh, and feelings, and those are ever-changing, as is the, the landscape of repayment options for student borrowers. And how have borrowers managed to keep up with their payments since the repayment pause ended last fall? Well, there's a little bit of a silver lining here in that most borrowers have been able to keep up with the payments since the end of the pause. 56% have made at least a few of those payments. 46% uh, made most or every payment. And so that part is encouraging. Now, some may not be making regular payments or, or on a regular frequency of payments uh, if they're part of an income-driven repayment plan where maybe the payments are set at zero for now or those who are in forbearance. But it's a little more positive than, uh, than we were anticipating. And college is expensive for so many people. What can borrowers do to reduce student loan burden, especially as they start their new careers? Well, do your homework. Uh, there are uh, lots of resources available. Uh, start with studentaid.gov and look at the different kinds of repayment plans that are out there. If you're not in school yet or you have loved ones who are maybe middle school, high school who are looking to go to college, uh, get yourself some financial education. Uh, research shows that uh, people will borrow better uh, and borrow less to go to college, uh, and they will graduate with 21% less uh, credit card debt or less likely to have credit card debt upon graduation. So educate yourself on all avenues of this and be sure to fill out and apply uh, for student aid through the federal application for federal, excuse me, free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA. Uh, a lot of people don't complete it because of you know, income, thinking their income's too high, the application may be too complicated or just don't know about it. So make sure you're applying for the aid uh, and educate yourself of the difference between public and private loans, grant scholarships, work study, things like that. And where can we go to learn more? If you're interested in these data, uh, please visit nefe.org. That's our website. Uh, and if you want more information about uh, student loans and repayment plans, and if you're uncertain with where things stand, uh, if it's uh, if if something's in the court system or if its repayment has actually started, uh, go to studentaid.gov as your starting point. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, Dr. Hensley. Happy to be here. As we head into the final stretch of election season, financial security and privacy are on the minds of voters everywhere. A new survey from Grayscale Investments in the Harris Poll dives into how Americans feel about protecting their personal financial data, investing in crypto and government involvement in financial security. Joining us today is Craig Salm, Chief Legal Officer at Grayscale Investment, who's going to try to break down these findings and explain how they could influence voters in the upcoming election. 
Craig, thanks for joining us, my friend. Thank you so much for having me. All right, can you tell us more about this recent survey and some of the key takeaways? So Grayscale is a leading asset management firm with an expertise in crypto. We've been conducting a year-long study to determine what are likely American voters thinking about in the context of the upcoming election as it relates to crypto and investing generally. And some of the high-level findings we found are that inflation is the number one issue uh, that most Americans are thinking about, with the number two most pressing issue being the state of the economy. Now, given that crypto can serve as both a hedge against inflation and as a store of value, you might not be surprised to learn that more Americans are more focused on what are political candidates uh, thinking about in crypto and want them to have an informed view. That number is about 56 percent of those that we polled. And on top of that, more Americans own or are likely to own crypto in the future, with that number being about 20 percent. And so over time with this study, we've been finding that Americans increasingly want their political candidates to have at least an informed view on crypto. So have the view on crypto investing changed in the recent years uh, and, and, and during the survey? The number I mentioned, 56 percent of Americans being more likely to vote for a candidate who has an informed view on crypto is a 4 percent increase from back in May and then another 4 percent increase from back in December. So you're seeing an 8 percent increase over time, which to us is very statistically significant uh, and certainly something that candidates should be thinking about as they're going on their campaigns. Um, we were trying to think about what are the reasons why Americans are more focused on crypto now. And a couple of the significant events that happened earlier this year was the approval of exchange traded products for two of the most prominent crypto assets, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And to that end, Grayscale offers products for those assets are Grayscale Bitcoin Mini Trust and Grayscale Ethereum Mini Trust for investors that want to express that view. So what did they say about the uh, importance of financial security and privacy from some of these survey respondents? So in addition to inflation and the state of the economy, we want to focus in on other aspects of financial well-being that American voters are really focused on, uh, specifically privacy and, and security, as you mentioned. And what we found is that three in four Americans view financial privacy as very important to them. So that was an interesting finding to us and something we really want to focus on in future phases of the study. And what is the level of public trust and government agencies and banking institutions uh, to safeguard this personal financial data? We found that Americans are more trustworthy of banks in contrast to the government in terms of preserving their own financial privacy, uh, which may be interesting or surprising to some viewers. And so certainly something we want to focus in on more with upcoming phases of the study. Just in the context of crypto, assets like Bitcoin are not so good at preserving financial privacy. And so over time, there's other assets that have been developed that do layer financial privacy on top of Bitcoin. These are assets like Zcash, which Grayscale actually offers a product for as well for investors that are more interested in that kind of financial privacy. Uh, but certainly something we're going to focus in on as this survey continues in future waves. All right, thanks for joining me this morning. Where can we go for more information? For more information about this survey, uh, viewers can just go to grayscale.com slash elections. Thanks for joining me this morning. Thank you for having me. You know, as the temperatures dip and the leaves begin to change colors, and fall from the, I don't know, from the sky, no, from the trees onto the ground, Families everywhere are geared up for a season full of fun and festivities. And today we have Emily L. Foley. She's here with some few ways to spend it with the people who matter most, those loved ones in your lovely life. Welcome to the show, Emily. How are you? Hi, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me today. So what's your first tip for helping families enjoy the fall season? Yeah, you know, fall is the perfect time for the entire family to dress up, and that includes pets. According to Forbes.com, pet ownership is at an all-time high, with 66% of U.S. households owning at least one pet. And Target knows that. Of course, we know Target for their great value, their incredible product assortment, and their design partnerships. So their latest design partnership is called the Cuddle Collab, and it was actually inspired by six social media fur fluencers. It is incredibly cute. It's a limited time collection that includes coordinated outfits to create Instagram worthy moments while keeping everyone snug during the fall weather. There's 180 different items spanning apparel and accessories for pets and pet lovers, as well as toys, treats, food, games, even home decor. Starting at just $3, I absolutely love these matching sweater and sweatshirt, one for your human child and one for your fur child to have a little face off over who the fave child is. You can find these at Target.com and in most Target stores while supplies last. All right, Kat, do you need any of those? I have him look. Anything you like? No, he's, he's just sleeping. All right. So now that uh, the family and the pets are looking good together, how do we help like our kids feel their best? Uh, for outdoor fall fun? 
Yeah, so children often don't get the essential vitamins that they need from their diet alone. As a parent, I am keenly aware of that. And parents are always looking for vitamins that are packed full of nutrients. So Haya is shaking things up in the childhood nutrition game because they have created effective supplements formulated specifically for kids. So no gummy additives, no added sugar, no artificial flavors or colors, just the good stuff that kids need to thrive. Actually, 15 plus essential vitamins and minerals. The American Heart Association says that kids consume too much sugar, which is not a big surprise. But what is surprising is that some vitamins actually contain up to five grams of sugar per serving, which is not helping the problem. So Haya has created these chewable vitamins that are naturally sweetened with monk fruit. So they have zero added sugar, but are still yummy. So really one of the only vitamins on the market that don't contribute to that overconsumption of sugar problem that children have. And you can find them at HayaHealth.com. All right, do you have any recommendations for family to stay connected and uh, comfortable no matter what the season kind of takes them? So this is the time of year where families want to stay connected, get connected. They want to have fun, but you also need to be prepared for the unexpected. It's hurricane season and a solar generator is a game changer for ensuring continuous power during potential outages. So Jackery.com is a leading brand in the industry. They're known for reliable quality and they just launched this new solar generator 2000 V2. So I'm going to get a little techie here with you, but this has seamless UPS backup with 2,042 watt-hour capacity. It has 1.3-hour fast charging to keep essential devices running during outages. It has multiple charging options for small devices, plug-and-play setup. It is also super quiet, which is a great change from gas generators. And it's the smallest, lightest lithium iron phosphate 2,000 watt-hour backup system on the market because it weighs just under 40 pounds, but it's also still very powerful. And it has solar charging support, making it a sustainable backup power solution as well, which I love. All right, so where can we go for all of these fall family fun ideas? You can follow me on Instagram at Emily L. Foley, and I'll have more info on everything we've talked about, plus lots of other fun fall things. Emily Foley, thanks for joining me this morning. Thank you so much for having me. Generative AI is disrupting the job market at lightning speed, presenting employers and employees with the need to evolve rapidly to meet challenging and changing expectations. A new study closing the gap, upskilling and reskilling in an AI era reveals key insights in how employers and employees are adapting to an AI driven workplace and what can be done better to meet future demands. So today we have Elise Awad, President and CEO of DeVry University, to uh, tell us a little more and give us insights on how AI is changing the job market. Welcome, Elise. Thank you. Well, uh, good morning. Good morning to you, too. Um, can you share some of the key findings from the study around the current approach of AI in the workplace? Yes, and I actually uh, love the, the words that you use, challenging and changing. Gen AI and machine learning are absolutely transforming the way we work. And so we wanted to, at DeVry University, understand this a bit better in, uh, through the lens of employers and employees. And so we conducted this study, uh, and it revealed that about 50% of workers believe AI will make their jobs easier, which is great news, um, with many uh, also acknowledging the importance of reskilling uh, and upskilling to leverage AI appropriately. But the study also found that there's a lack of proper training in adopting AI technology. So um, the data behind that is employers actually believe 32% of their employees are considered novices or beginners when it comes to AI literacy and proficiency. But employees only view themselves as novices at a 3% rate. So very different viewpoints. Uh, actually, employees think uh, at a 49% rate that they're intermediate or advanced. So clear disconnect on readiness in the workplace. And since AI is here to stay, how can we kind of make it our friend <laughs> and uh, use it to work for us in the workplace. So uh, AI is definitely here to stay. Uh, and I think companies need to implement AI strategies, robust AI strategies that include comprehensive training for all of their employees, not just a subset, um, to remain competitive, but also uh, don't you think it's probably important to properly train employees on how to use AI the right way so that you're avoiding any data privacy issues or cybersecurity issues. As you go back to the data, employees are using it. 
um, whether employers know it or not. And so I think training is going to be very important. Guilty. I use it all the time. <laughs> uh, so since it's happening, what do you think employees and employers needed to be doing to kind of close the upskilling and reskilling gaps in, in the workplace? Great question. And by the way, I'm guilty as well. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it makes your, your job more efficient and faster. And I think um, AI is now playing a larger role. Uh, and I think employers have more of a responsibility to provide these upskilling opportunities and training opportunities to all of their employees. I think um, it's very much two-sided as well. I think employees need to be proactive about seeking these opportunities to learn and grow and develop. Um, they could partner with higher education institutions like DeVry University. Uh, we work with a number of different industries across uh, sectors uh, to provide training on closing these skills gap in general. Um, AI is a part of that. Uh, so find partners to provide this training, but don't wait because AI is here to stay. All right, so where can we go for more information, my friend? You can go to devry.edu to learn more about the study and the data behind the study or to learn more about the programs that we offer. Thanks for joining me this morning. Thank you for having me. Online reviews have become one of the most trusted sources for consumers when making purchases. With more than half of shoppers relying on them for over, tra for over traditional ads or even advice from family and friends, we're about to approach National Leave a Review Day on October 22nd, and we're join, joined by Joe Burton, CEO of Reputation, the global, the global leader in reputation performance management, and he's here to share some insights from their latest survey on how reviews shape buying habits and what we can expect in the future. Joe, welcome to the show, my friend. Dan, thanks so much for having me. Uh, eager to share some cool stats about online reviews. Um, so why are online reviews like so important? Uh, you know, Dan, it is incredible. We recently uh, surveyed 2,000 Americans to find out what influences their purchasing decisions. And the answer is reviews, reviews, and more reviews. Reviews are more important, more influential than marketing, more influential than uh, than influencer opinions, sorry, social media, uh, more important than recommendations from family and friends. In fact, consumers find reviews more important than all of those other factors combined, and they are especially persuaded by reviews during challenging economic times and inflation. And it doesn't matter how old they are. Uh, it is uh, it cuts across generations. So what did the reputation survey tell us about uh, consumer buying habits? You know, one of the most surprising things was these days, a buyer journey, the selection of a product, be it an online purchase or a purchase that you're going to make locally at a at a store or vendor almost always starts online now. So the buyer journey almost always starts with basketball shoes near me, cars near me, best replacement windows near me. Up come a list of vendors, and the information about the vendors had better be right online. And then the and then 78% of the time, regardless of generation, the consumer clicks into those reviews, reads the reviews, good and bad, in order to make a decision whether to even jump in their car and uh, and go over and uh, and consider a vendor. So the buying process starts online with accurate information and with reviews every single time. So companies had better pay attention to them. So what other factors are important to shoppers when they're uh, making a purchase? Uh, you know, reviews are a really important um, um, avenue for finding out uh, whether to do business with a company. But consumers are looking for what we've always been looking for. Probably the big three are, we want a quality product service uh, or service. We want an easy transaction, and we want to, and we want to do business with people and companies that we think are listening to us, that we think are accommodating our needs and are understanding our wants. So online reviews that say that, so positive reviews from people that say, wow, Dan really listened to me and guided me to the right product, or even reviews that say, 
it was not a great experience, but then the company came in and made it right, turns that bad review into a super review. So really, really important to provide a great product, easy transaction, and great experience, and have your consumers expressing that about your company online. So how is uh, AI affecting the future of some of these online reviews? Boy, it feels like AI is affecting everything, and reviews are yet another uh, piece of that. So fake reviews used to be really easy to spot. We've all seen the ones that have bad grammar, weird misspelling, odd capital letters. AI improvements mean that well-written, coherent, but yet fake reviews are starting to become a problem. In fact, 53% of consumers uh, have expressed a concern about AI and reviews. Fortunately, you can fight AI with AI to a degree. So um, a strategic, responsible use of AI from a company like Reputation or others allows us to flag those fake reviews um, um, uh, uh, the vast majority of the time, which allows consumers to go back to trusting reviews and uh, trusting the vendors that the reviews are written about. So what is National Leave a Review Day and how can some of the people at home get involved? So such a fun day. National Re Leave a Review Day is on October 22nd this year. And it's a day that we ask everybody to get involved in uh, in the review process. 92% of consumers have left a review in the last year, but we ask everybody to leave a review on October 22nd, something you recently purchased, your local coffee shop, anything. And for businesses, this is a real call to action for you to start engaging those uh, consumer reviews and answering every one of them. As a business, if you don't know how, um, go to uh, nationalleaverreviewday.com and you'll see tips and tricks on how to do it. Joe Burton, you get five stars from me. Uh, highly recommend, there you go. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, thanks, thanks so much, Dan, right back at you. I'll, I'll be leaving a review. <laughs> All right, well, where can we go for more information, my friend? Uh, you know, obviously, uh, na uh, nationalleaverreviewday.com and reputation.com, our website, has all of these statistics I just gave, along with a bunch of others in a really fun, consumer-friendly way. Stop by and check it out. I'm sure you'll, uh, you'll learn something interesting. Thanks for joining me this morning, my friend. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate it. And that's it for New Mexico Rising. I want to thank you for tuning in and checking out the show. If you actually want to be on the show, just email me. That's NewMexicoRising at gmail.com. We have social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. Just look up New Mexico Rising TV. You could go to our website. That's NewMexicoRising.com. We got some merch and some of the books from some of our authors that we'll just send to you for free. We have a limited quality uh, quantity. All you got to do is pay for shipping. And if you want to find yourself uh, following our YouTube channel, that is at NM Rising. Make sure you like, comment, share, and uh, put that little bell button so that you get notified whenever we upload a new show. Until next week, that was New Mexico Rising.